Good morning, Digital Cathedral family, and let me just say Merry Christmas to all of you. Hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful Christmas with family and friends. Or if that's one of those Christmases that you're alone, it gives you some time to contemplate and think about what's ahead in the brand new year. So glad that you're with me this morning. It's a cold morning in Houston, Texas, so I've just, uh, I've got my sweatshirt on this morning, and I know it's cold over almost all of the country. Some of you have gone through some heavy snows, and uh, if, if you're just in place today, just get snug as a bug in a rug, and enjoy the time that we have together at the Digital Cathedral. It is Christmas morning. I don't know how many of you will be watching. Some of you are traveling, some with family. So it's one of those mornings uh, that's rare, only every few years that Christmas falls on Sunday morning. But I always enjoy Christmas on Sunday morning. It just seems like it adds a little bit of something extra to the time that we spend together. This morning we're going to do something a little different than we've ever done on this Christmas, which to me, Christmas, one, of the, one of the powers of Christmas is this to me is when uh, not only did God in the flesh make his entrance into the earth, but really it's the birth, it's the start, the seed form of the new covenant. And so this morning, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about covenant, but I'm not gonna do the whole message this morning. In fact, I'm gonna turn it over in just a minute to one of my good friends. I'm gonna do something at the Digital Cathedral that I've never done before. I used to do it all the time when I was a pastor in a building, and that is to have a special speaker. I've never had anybody as a special speaker on the Digital Cathedral, but because this is that seed form of new covenant coming to earth that when he was 33 would give his life, die on a cross, r r rise from the tomb, get up, get up and walk out of that tomb with all of us, make us new creations, that new covenant begins. I wanted to bring the man in that is to me the probably the best teacher on the planet about the covenant. First time I heard him was in 1983. It was by a cassette tape. Uh, someone gave me in the church. I just started Grace Point Community Church in Houston, and somebody gave me a uh, cassette tape by this man. I listened to it. It was phenomenal teaching. I had, it, was, it would be years before I would meet him, but when I did, we've become good friends. So there's no one that I would rather have on the Digital Cathedral Christmas morning talking about life in the covenant other than my good friend Malcolm Smith. Malcolm is down in Bandera, I'm in Houston, but thanks to technology, he can join us today here at the Digital Cathedral. So I want you to pay close attention this morning, go back and listen a couple times, because I'll assure you whatever Malcolm has to say is gonna be good and it's gonna be heavy. So Malcolm, if you're with us, I want you to feel at liberty, feel at home with the Digital Cathedral, people here, uh, are going to enjoy whatever it is that you have to say. I will see you in person in just a couple of weeks when we do our Journey One conference with our with our mutual friend Steve McVeigh. And in down in Bandera, we're going to zoom it out of your facility. So, by the way, Digital Cathedral family, if you have not registered for that conference yet, you need to do it. I I keep after my people that I associate with to make sure you're in that conference because it can be something extra special. It's gonna be the start of something I think we're going to do on a continual basis. This is, we're calling it Journey One, and it's gonna be a journey into the spirit. So when we do Journey Two, Journey Three, Journey Four, there'll be different dimensions and aspects of the kingdom that we're gonna get into. Anyway, this morning, special guest, Malcolm Smith, Bandera, Texas. Malcolm, if you're there, God bless you. Please feel free to, to teach whatever you'd like to teach this morning about life in the covenant. We'll see you next week, uh, Sunday morning. Bid be the first week of the brand new year, so we're going to start some good stuff. So, Malcolm, God bless you, brother. The Lord be with you, everyone. And before I plunge into what we want to share Tonight, I do want to thank every one of you who have sent offerings. Um, we, we send this out literally to the entire world uh, for free every week. And we are able to do that by the offerings of the people of God. There are 
many who are partners with us, but there are also many of you who send that occasional gift, but in every case, in every case, it fits right in like a Lego piece to what we need. And so thank you, everyone, and the whole world thanks you because we're all in this virtual audience tonight because of the gifts of you people. And I want to share a very simple message tonight, um, and I, I want really to explain what some things mean and, and let the Bible speak for itself. But I want to go to Psalm 23, and of course, way back, I don't know how many um, sessions ago, we did what, six, seven weeks on it, but this I just want to, as I say, take a simple look as this applies to your life, my life, right now. And so let me read it, and uh, I know you probably will just go along reading it in your head with me, but I want you to get the feel of this psalm. And where it says, the Lord, and I think by now you know that is a very bad translation of the name of God, which is I am. And so I am is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yes, as I said, you know that psalm. Probably... You may never have been in church in your life, but you know that psalm, or at least parts of it. And I, I want to concentrate on the last verse because it sums up all that's gone before. And so if I want a text to share with you, it would be verse 6. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me. You can say that for yourself all the days of my life. But look at the psalm um, historically, and we've been there before, so I'm not staying more than a few seconds. Um, it was not written as this uh, King David was sitting under a weeping willow with his guitar and the quiet waters and lush green meadows were at his feet and he just felt like this psalm. No. This psalm was written when his son Absalom was intent. It was a mission his son was on to kill his father. And he's very close to doing that. Uh, it would say the enemies of David at this point, uh, headed by Absalom, are closing in. It was a terrifying moment. And it was at that moment he wrote this psalm which tells me there's something in this psalm that is of tremendous importance because a man who can write this psalm when his own flesh and blood is descending on him to kill him. What is the source of David's faith, expectancy, peace, which would be probably the better word here? Um, what, where, where's his courage coming from? the foundation and the heart of those words I've just used, the foundation and heart of his peace, the, the foundation of his faith was in the covenant. And that covenant is referred to in one way or another throughout the whole psalm. But let me um, 
emphasize at this point that the word covenant, it means in the scripture that God initiated covenant with you and I. That's an incredible statement I've just made. Uh, you don't make covenant with God. He has already made covenant with you. You could sum that up. That's the story of the Bible. Um, in fact, the words testament, as in Old Testament, New Testament, testament there should be translated covenant. It's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And, and so there it is. It's bookends to the Bible, um, the covenant. And the word that I want to look at in this last verse of the psalm, surely goodness and loving kindness. Loving kindness is connected with covenant in an unbreakable fashion. There's no way that you can talk about covenant without moving to loving kindness and vice versa. Loving kindness, as we're going to see, is the way in which God who makes the covenant, he now works that out hour by hour in our lives. And so the word loving kindness is a word which we, we're always thinking of covenant when we say loving kindness. And when we say covenant, we expect loving kindness to mean that this is not a one-time event, but it is entering into our life at every step that we make. Now, I've said this before, but it's very important that a covenant is never to be paralleled to a contract. Today, at least here in the USA, People talk about contract. You rarely hear the word covenant. And I have had too many people who will talk to me or question me concerning the contracts that God has made with man. There is no such thing. A contract has no place and is never mentioned in the scripture because it is set against a covenant. You see, a contract is a document of suspicion. It's a document that assumes separation. And it's a document written out of distrust. Well, that's a good beginning. What, what, is, what, what is a contract? It's a, something you draw up in order to protect yourself. And, and you, you expect you'll need it. So you're anticipating hurt from somebody. You're anticipating someone's trying to get you and you'll have a loss out of this. And so you draw up a contract to protect yourself. Um, you could say a contract is the armor by which you protect yourself from being vulnerable. Outside of a contract, you feel like a lobster without its shell. Um, it's no, you need something to protect yourself from people you do not trust. In fact, you've got downright suspicion that if you turn your back, they are going to hurt you. So you have the contract, and you know the contract says, if you do this, then I will do that. If you do not do this, then I will do this, and you're going to pay for it and you both sign the contract. Now, if you're getting, you know, a new water heater in your house, or if you're putting in, a, you know, a new pathway across the garden, it's good to have a contract, I suppose. But there's no possibility of a relationship and a contract. Covenant. The Bible word and the word that you will find actually still used throughout the third world and was part of our Western world too at one point. Covenant means the binding together of two parties. Binding. It's, it's almost we could use the word chain. It, it's a binding that is strong but it is the binding chain of love. It, it means that I am yielding myself to the person that I trust. I trust them with my life. 
It is love that seeks union with the other person, and that love wills to bind us together. And so when a covenant was made, and still is in many parts of the world, it is accompanied with a blood oath. That means some part of your bodies, and I've told you before, I've seen it in Africa on the tips of their fingers, across their hand, across, and the blood is running. And as the blood runs down, then is the word spoken of binding love and loyalty to the other, even all of life and for death, meaning I will die to keep this. That is the strength of a covenant. Um, and so you have two parties who will function in all of life as one. They are two, but they bound together by love are one. They are sharing their very persons with each other. They're certainly sharing their possessions if need be. That is covenant. So what does covenant mean? It means that you stand face to face with the person with whom you're in covenant without fear. Fear doesn't enter your mind. You, you've given yourself to this person. You trust them and therefore fear is completely negated. There is no possibility of fear. There's no possibility of a sense of guilt, or I'm not enough, or I'm unworthy. There's no sense of shame. There's no sense of embarrassment that feels I ought not to be here. Because you are washed in an acceptance that puts the arms around you and says you're included. Maybe that's the best word tonight. You are included. You are part of my life. You're accepted, you see. And, and, and the person accepts you thus with, with a, a sunny disposition, a, a face of delight, meaning that there's no dark across the brow that suggests, I wonder if I'm doing the right thing here. No, a covenant has already solved all of that, and love binds you together. Do you realize I'm talking of how God feels about you? That's what I am. That's the word covenant, you see. And it means that you stand before God. Um, and, and let me say it again, standing, standing face to face with Father and Son and Holy Spirit without fear, no fear, because fear has punishment, says 1 John 4, and therefore perfect love, which is the love I'm talking about, casts out the fear, because there's no even thought of punishment, not, not from the real God. There, there's no sense of guilt. There's no groveling and saying, I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy. Oh no, that doesn't belong to the God who revealed himself in Jesus Christ. There's no guilt. Jesus has lifted all guilt out of existence. There's no shame or embarrassment. You are assured. You are included into this binding love of the Father in the Son through the Holy Spirit with the joy that is beyond human comprehension. Okay, that's covenant. And, and covenant is, is the focus of intention. It's not a passing idea. You know, there's plenty of people you like, but, and you might even call them sort of friends on the fringe of your world, but covenant. I mean, this, this you lead up to it, and once it is completed, you are within that world of covenant for the rest of your life. And not uh, just a word, but as I say, with your blood running down your arm for life or for death, we belong together. Um, and, and so you see, covenant is a trust, trust. And it's a trust that desires union. It's not just a, a passing, I trust you for this transaction. No, this is a trust that I desire to live out my life with this person and persons in union together. As I said, the two function as one. Love 
is the essence of the covenant. And love by its efforts, effort, sorry, essence desires to unite. Come on. Some people say that, what, one person said the other day that Malcolm's gone mystical. <laughs> no. Come on. Can, can you imagine love that does not desire to unite? It's in the definition, man. It's in the definition. Love, by definition, the essence of love, wills to unite with the beloved. That's the essence of covenant. That's what it's all about. The joyful surrender, the giving of ourselves. Oh, it's not that hang dog, you know, you put your head down, I dedicate myself, I give my... No, this is the delight, the dance, that he loves me and has given himself to me. And that love creates a love response that desires to just be his. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine joyful and, and and it's a chosen vulnerability you are exposing yourself to the eyes of god knowing that he sees you as his beloved and he is infinite safety there's no fear with god cannot be only the god that adam invented in his darkness otherwise known as religion but all fear all sense of separation, that he's up and we're down, he's over. No, no, that's all gone, gone. The real God is ne never separate. He is seamlessly united to us. He's simultaneously one with us because that's what it means by the fact he loves you. That's it. It says in the scripture that covenant and of course, loving kindness it is the foundation of the throne of God, meaning it's his very being. If we could speak of God having a foundation, it is love. Everything springs out of his love, loving kindness, covenant. Just, just weigh this. The entire Bible bears witness to this, and the book of Hebrews actually states it. It says, he gives himself to us. Those words are almost too big for a human mouth. He gives himself to us. But he didn't only give it with words. Hebrew says that he gave us two things by where we would know he cannot lie. Because not only his word, but he swore a covenant oath, saying that he gives himself to us and will not and cannot leave us. And he goes on, if God swore an oath of covenant, who did he swear by? For when humans make a covenant, they call upon and swear upon the God they worship. Well, who does God call upon when he enters into these unbreakable covenant with us? Says Hebrews, he called upon himself. Which means in plain English, if he doesn't keep covenant, then he will cease to be and the whole universe will dissolve into nothing. Huh. You talk about loyal. You talk about unchanging. You talk about steadfast love. Yes, that's what we're talking about. That's how he loves you right at this very minute. Let, let me read to you from one of the greatest Psalms when it comes to um, speaking about covenant. Uh, it's Psalm 89, and I'm going to spot read that is here and there. It's a great psalm. In verse 28, he says, My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. I will not break off my loving kindness from him, nor deal falsely 
in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. That is, he said, I won't go back and sneak in, you know, cross something out and say, well, things have changed since then. No. He says, I will never alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. It's a statement of covenant. Could I say the obvious? That as I'm speaking these words to you concerning the very being and intent of God, the Holy Spirit pointing to that, it arises within you. I can rest my entire being on such a God of such a covenant. I can rest my entire being upon his person. He cannot go back on his word of love to me. I, I, I can rest in every word of promise he's made without fear that he'll renege on me. Or to put it another way, God who speaks a revelation of himself to us and speaks his words of promise to us, he is absolute reality. Well, you see, there's a lot of things that don't look like God. I know they're not reality. I see these words very quickly, but they are the words of absolute truth. There are many things that you see, and they are true. They have substance. They are there. But reality is not simply some things that are true, presently anyway. Reality is the truth, which is always and always has been and always will be truth. It is true that outside this studio, the wind is picking up. There's going to be a hailstorm. That's true. It's absolutely true. I can see it in the sky, wait for it to come. But that is not the truth about weather in Bandera, Texas. Truth is unbeginning, unending. Truth is who God is. Many things happen, and they happen or don't happen, and people think they happen when they didn't happen. There's a, but it's not reality. The only time I foot, put my foot down on absolute rock-solid reality is when I have uh, free-fallen into the person of this God who revealed himself in Jesus, and build my life upon who he is. What is David saying here? He is saving, saying that this covenant relationship, loving kindness that he has with this real God is more real than Absalom. Can you get that? I tell you, he says here, and it's that, in verse 6 that I said I would, would talk about. It. it says, Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. Do you know that to my research, that's the only time that the words follow me are used in a positive sense. You see, the word follow me is really, it's, it's too weak. I mean, that's really not what it means. Follow me, it means to relentlessly pursue. Follow me is, I don't know, too gentle. <laughs> the, the, the word is used every other time. It's used all through the Bible, but it's used every time of an enemy that is bearing down upon you. He's almost got you, and he's not going to quit till he does get you. And so the word is used, the, the enemies pursued them, pursued, you know, they're, they're, they're relentless in their pursuit. And there, this one time David uses it to describe goodness and loving kindness are pursuing me. He said they're relentless. I can, it's like if the dogs were after me and I can, I can feel their hot breath on my neck. Now, why did he do that? Because it's written, remember, over against Absalom. 
Absalom was relentlessly pursuing David. And David is saying, and he uses the word once in all the scripture, he says, yeah, Absalom is pursuing me relentlessly, but loving kindness, God's commitment to covenant. He is relentlessly pursuing me, and he's closer than Absalom, and he's more real than Absalom, and therefore I am in the refuge of God's hand. Let me say to you, every one of you, that whatever is happening to you right now, the loving kindness, the covenant keeping God is more real. Or could I say it far better? He is the only real in a lot of things that seem real to you right now, but they're not. He's, he's the real. He pursues you. That, that's loving kindness. And um, we, we are joined to this, this God. Um, and, and he does it at his initiative. And, and there's no contract that says, if you do this, I'll do this. But if you don't, I am. No, that doesn't work like that. He loves you. And you are the apple of his eye. And his arms are around you in this word, loving kindness. And so let me say it again, loving kindness. It's the word that describes this covenant it, it's, and of course, it's the God of the covenant who is working out that covenant, that binding love, that desire to be united together. It's being worked out and made reality day by day. And that word is loving kindness. So loving kindness is loyalty to a covenant. That might be its first meaning, loyalty. It means I, I am loyal to this covenant even if it kills me to be so. And so whenever you see the word loving kindness in the scripture, and it's used a lot in the Psalms, you'll always find it saying that God is doing loving kindness, or he's keeping loving kindness, or he's remembering loving kindness or remembering the covenant. It's never just hanging loosely by itself. It is an action word. It is the energy of God moving into your life to do you good and to fulfill his love intention towards you. And, and so th this is you. I mean, take a break in your head right now. If, if you, you are right now being pursued by, by the glorious army of goodness and this loving kindness pursuing you right into your living room where you're straight into the car where you're listening to this podcast. God's loving kindness is not sitting over there a long way off saying, well, when you get your act together, when you read your Bible enough, when you go to church enough, when you tithe enough, yeah, I'll come and see what I can do. No, he, he takes the initiative. He, he started this. He's pursuing you. You're not, you gotta, I've got to pursue God. I'm chasing God. No, you're not. God pursues you. God is chasing you. And that's when, when I realize that, that arouses all my longing for him. What a God. What a glorious God. What a fantastic God. My response is to a God who is like this. I didn't start this. He doesn't need to be woken up. God doesn't need to be found because he's hiding from you because he can't stand the sight of your sin. No, that's Adam's foul, dirty God. The beautiful God of the Bible is the God who is love and he is pursuing us because he loves us with a love that won't quit. And he's coming at this moment as I am speaking into your life. And he's been coming and been coming and been coming throughout your life. Wake up and realize he comes into our lives in the personal, personal energy of his love. The ability of his love joining 
causing us to realize the joining with him. See, when the New Testament opens, we come on a new word, which is a Greek word, because the New Testament was written in a different language, Greek. And that word is agape. Now, fascinating, you know. The word agape, if I just took it to say, what does it mean? Leave it be. Just what does it mean without everything it means in the New Testament? What does the word agape mean? It's two words joined together, which means a shepherd that is leading a sheep to rest. Wow! Agape really means the 23rd Psalm. That's the meaning of the word, if I didn't join it to everything else. But after I've joined it to everything the New Testament says about that word agape, the love of God in action, I'm still left with the fact it is love that leads us to rest, providing, protecting, watching for hurts and broken bones. That's what a shepherd did in, in Bible days, Old Testament days, but is, is true today out there. Let me tell you something else. The word shepherd in the Hebrew language was also used to describe your best friend. Now, isn't that? I am is my shepherd could also be translated without any twisting of words. I am is my best friend. That, that would have to describe covenant, wouldn't it? I mean, um, everything I've said about covenant and loving kindness, if that isn't your best friend, I don't know what is. And, and, and so shepherd, I am is my shepherd, my very best friend. And what a shepherd does in the New Testament, it's the word agape, the great love of God that desires from unbeginning to be united to us. And he's the one that right now, sit back and realize he's providing right now, he's protecting, he's watching, he knows every hurt, he knows every brokenness, and he's the one that has given himself to be your healer, the one who brings shalom to your entire being and holds you and speaks his reality to you. So loving kindness is really, in a very great sense, the very being and essence of God. It's not something he has, it's who he is. When Moses, way back, what is it, Exodus 33, 34? He says, show me your glory. And I'm not even touching that because we'd be here for too many hours. Um, but the glory of God essentially, show me, show me your very being, show me your essence, which amounts to we know God by his opinion of us. And, and so that glory, that beauty, that breathtaking wonder of who he is. He revealed it to Moses up to a point, and he began with the glory of God, the name of God, the being of God is loving kindness. He cannot, God cannot be other than he is. That's pretty obvious, but some people seem to think so. Some people think that he can change on a dime and, and, and suddenly be this mean, mad God. No, he is this God of loving kindness who has sworn upon his own being to be the one who is love to us, who will never leave us nor forsake us, who protects us, who provides us, who is with us in the deepest sense, with our innermost being. He cannot be other than that. See, he doesn't have it. That's the point. Nowhere does he say God has love. He doesn't have loving kindness. He is it. That's the difference. If you have something, well, you can have not it <laughs> and tomorrow have something else. But if you is it, you cannot be other than you is. That's loving kindness. It's a fantastic word. I've told you, I've said more than once, it's loyalty, steadfastness, immovableness, 
to the covenant promises, to the person of the covenant. But it's got other shadows of meaning, which all come into what it is. It, it describes bending down to serve someone, and in fact, pick them and draw them up to yourself. That, that is strongly in the meaning of the word. It, it is not that you are to grovel before me because I have decided to be favorable. No, that's Adam's God. No, the true God says, let me get a hold of you. Let me put my arms around you. Let me draw you to myself. It is also could be translated as womb love. Do you get that? Womb love, or shall I say mother love? Mother love. Uh, Dangerous, mother love. You don't mess with her cubs. Not, I mean, that dog you have, the sweetest dog, licks you all over until she has puppies and then watch it. You are very careful how you approach because, and the word is loving kindness, if you could apply it to a dog, it is, she is fiercely and continually, recklessly going to protect her young. That's loving kindness. I remember when I was in Africa Um, And we were driving down this um, sort of dirt road and and there ahead of us, um, a baby elephant came out. Have you ever seen a baby elephant? Um, I mean, this was real baby and and little tiny thing. But of course, with a perfect trunk and it was a perfect elephant, only just a little tiny thing. And, and, And it came out into the middle of the dirt track and and immediately anyone in that car who knew anything said stop reverse in top gear go why because where there's a little tiny baby elephant guess who's only a few feet behind it is mother elephant and the most terrible animal in africa is a female elephant with babies and she will not just knock you off the road there will be nothing left to anyone to find of you after she's finished and and so i mean we we at least stopped and um i i i wanted to reverse a lot faster but we we stopped anyway and There it stood, the little tiny elephant. Of course, it was quite innocent, and it looked at us and put its little trunk up in the air. And then, inevitable, out from the bush came Mother Elephant. And she came and stood over the little elephant. And, and, I mean, all this was seconds. And, and, And she turned toward us, and her trunk in the air let out this bellow of rage. And her big ears of an African elephant were going like, like a helicopter and within seconds she would have been charging down toward us only at that point our driver did reverse in a great hurry but as we were reversing that little elephant looked around the edge of mother's great legs and put up his trunk and in that moment I said that's loving kindness You are in the presence of a fierce love. Don't touch my baby. And at the same time, we were in the presence of total peace. Shalom. That little elephant knew we weren't going to touch it and he could actually wave us goodbye. That is loving kindness. I'm not pushing that. That is it. It's womb love. It is mother love that protects and will protect even to death. As you know full well, animals do that. And mothers are well capable of that, as every mother listening knows. 
And, and you can find this elsewhere in the scripture. This that I'm talking about, this love that's got his arms around you. And as 1 John 5 says, the wicked one touches you not, you'd better believe it. And, and so this love is, is called embracing. If we, if we translated it to its full extent, it would be a bear hug. It's in the Acts of the Apostles more than once where the Holy Spirit fell upon. Remember that? That word in the Greek language, fell upon, is to embrace to the point of being a bear hug. Have you ever thought about that? God, the Holy Spirit, loves you so much, he gives you a bear hug of delight. Uh, Jesus, in his parables, called it putting it on his shoulder and, and holding it. That's as close as you can get. The other parable talks about it as the father hugging, bear hugging the son and kissing him all over. Zephaniah 3 says, talks about singing over us. The Lord your God in the midst of his mighty sings over you. Do you know this God that came to us in Jesus? Loving kindness. It is compassion. It's tender love. You're never afraid of this love. It's tender love, gentle love. It's goodness. It's kindness. He's giving himself to guard and keep you from all enemies and all threats. He's your strength in all opportunities and challenges. And he is it, which means it's not casual. You don't wake up in the morning wondering if he's in a good mood. His kindness is not based on feelings. It's based on his will, intention, covenant, committed love. Oh, just, just, just realize that you are in a vast ocean right at this minute. Just realize it. You are in a vast ocean, which of course surrounds you on all sides. And because you're at the bottom of that ocean, it's inside of you as well as outside of you. Only it's not killed you. You're more alive than you've ever been in your life. It's the ocean of God's love. Or would it easier if you realized yourself to be in the energy field, the personal energy field of love. And then as, as you go into the scripture and find its definitions, he, he just keep to the Psalms. What's it say about loving kindness? It's abounding. Well, that, that's a word that means sort of your, it's, it's like, almost like um, being in a, a super bubble bath on all sides. It's, it's all, all around me and, and it's active on my behalf, abounding. Another one in the Psalms is loving kindness higher than the heavens. And of course, the heavens were as high as the people could think in those days. And so this is beyond my thinking. Um, another, the prophet said it covers the earth. And then the, the word described as a shield actually should be a wrap around shield all around us. All these words, they're always in the superlative to describe loving kindness, this love who is towards you. And this psalm alone, if this is all we ever had, it describes an abounding, an abundance of contentment. Could you get beyond? <laughs> he makes me lie down in green pastures. And the word there in the Hebrew language is lush green meadows. He leads me beside quiet waters, so there's no fear to the skittish sheep. I mean, could you get better than that? Contentment? That, that, that's, that's shalom. That is peace that brings harmony, brings my whole life into sync. And then it ends up and says this is pursuing you all the time, all the time, all the time. You're never alone. Oh, I am is my shepherd, my best friend. 
takes in all these words, all these ideas. And David wrote that in the middle of a word that totally contradicted everything he said. I couldn't say those words any slower without running out of time. He did not, this is not a report on what his eyes could see, nor is it a report on how his feelings were if they were let loose to rule him. He comes down to what is the reality in this moment. And this is it. This is reality. And therefore I say it. And I, I, I might also um, say that, I think I've said it, but that word that begins the text, surely, surely, you know, it's, it's a word that, how can I put it? It doesn't need to be there. The word, the sentence would make perfect sense if I just say goodness and loving kindness. But surely, it means this is not something when you're on an emotional high. This isn't something that pops up on good days and you feel, you know, it's a wonderful day. No because it ends surely, but then ends in saying all the days of my life and under all the days of my life come some pretty bad days, some days in which you think you will never see the sun again. Well, he says surely, which means absolutely you can bank your life on this, surely. It's absolute and final truth, surely goodness and loving kindness will pursue you all the days of your life, even when Absalom is almost at your tent door. It depends where you're looking. It depends what you expect. All days, fear-filled days. But he said when they're full of fear, and my enemy is so close I can see them. He says, you say it's time for a party. And he says, you spread a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. It's as if you, you've spread the feast and there's a fire. Well, probably the fire is the glory of your presence. But he says, I, I look there as I'm sitting eating my feast, my party with you, and I can see their glowing eyes out there in the darkness. I'm surrounded, all these glowing eyes. He says, yeah, but um, that's who you are. Your, your protection is so absolute. They got so close. I can see their eyes in the dark with the, with the glory of God reflected from them, but they won't come any closer. The wicked one touches him not. We learn. We learn. You don't get it all at once. We learn not to look at appearances, but to him. I am the unchanging and the only real. And so we expect his loving kindness to be made manifest in this day. This day, whatever this day holds. In this here and this now. That's what he's saying. Do you remember what he said in Psalm 27? And that's another psalm that we could spend two weeks on. He says, I would have despaired if I had not believed to see the goodness of I am in the land of the living. He said, it was all over. I was done. I was finished. Unless I had believed something other than my circumstances. I believed to see the goodness, the loving kindness of I am in the land of the living. And you say, well, um, that, that's, that's all very well. But um, you see, if you, if you knew what I'd done, I mean, my life is full of sin and failure. All I can ever say when I get around God is uh, I'm unworthy, I'm a sinner, I'm sorry. No, you didn't get the memo. Jesus came and he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
and he's the fulfillment of the new covenant loving kindness which says your sin and your iniquity I will remember no more. Is it not a wondrous thing that this loving kindness has not only wiped out your sin but brought you face to face with the Father that loves you? Face to face, eye to eye with Him and there is no guilt and there is no shame and no embarrassment. And He flings His arms around you and says, You are included. You are my son, my daughter. Yeah. And if you know anything about David, you know that he had plenty. In fact, when it comes to Absalom, he'd made a mess of being a father with Absalom. But that's another story. But already in this psalm, what did he say? He restores my soul. And what does the word restore mean? It means, the word restore means to take me back to the place where I fell off the path. That's what shepherds do. If a sheep goes wandering off the path, the shepherd doesn't go and bludgeon the sheep and kick it in the face and say, you stupid sheep, get down there and grovel and say, I'm not worthy to be your sheep. No, that's Adam's God. No, no. no. What does a real shepherd do? He goes where the sheep is and he picks it, he turns it around, he restores it, he brings it back to the place where it fell off. That's all part of loving kindness. And all this confession of your sin. What did I just say? It's been taken away. What, what are you doing? So, so you, you fell, you made a mistake. Look, confession is not telling God about sin. Confession is telling sin about God. Telling your sin, the mistake you've just made, that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from sin. He's taken away my sin and I am in the presence of the God who will not quit loving me. No, no that, well, I've been talking about you this whole hour. Let, let, let me quickly say this, that... Um, the, the psalm is actual participation in the covenant. He's, he's, not a, uh, he, he's not a professor in his study, you know, um, talking about covenant. He's up to his earlobes in it. And I find it fascinating. This whole psalm is an exercise in imagination because he's got to go into a place of real where he can see things as they real are, really are. And so he goes into his Holy Spirit energized imagination and he sees himself there as the covenant sheep and he relishes all that is his as a sheep to the point where he feels the lush green meadow and he's there by the quiet waters. He sees in his imagination and feels being in this covenant love energy. You see, you imagine this is far too short a time. That's why I'm doing it in the, the retreat in Florida. I'm giving whole hour at least to Holy Spirit inspired imagination. It's a big subject. But I'll, I'll throw this at you because it belongs here. We, we imagine ourselves to be who we believe ourselves to be. Do you get that? You imagine, you, you hold this image, image, imagination of yourself. And it's always yourself as you believe yourself to be. And then you see yourself doing things and being things which are, in fact, in your imagination, a, a preview of coming attractions. Do you know what I mean? When you go to the movies and there's 20 minutes or more uh, of all that's going to come. 
which means the movies that you're seeing bits of, they're already made. They just haven't been released in this theatre yet. And so they give you bits of it and they call it the preview of coming attractions. Hey, there is a love purpose that already is. And you are getting little bits of it here. And you're seeing that you are. You're beloved of God. And you're beginning, some of you have already realized, you're, you're seeing yourself as you truly are the beloved of God. And you're seeing Him not in terms of doom. You're not seeing life in terms of a total crashing, breakdown apocalypse. By the way, that's imagination and we call it anxiety. Got it? Some of you are very good at it. No, um, we, we, we have the opposite now. Imagination that has been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. To look at this and say, that's me. And, and to imagine with the Holy Spirit, our guide and teacher, we imagine this life that is in Christ. And when we have the bad news and when we have the threats, we soar above it and see this as God sees it. Look, every time you get in your car to go on a journey, you do actually imagine the whole journey ahead of you. That's why you can drive at 60 miles an hour and not keep stopping to ask someone how to get there. Because in your head, you can see the road and, and you, you can see the place you're getting to. And God made you like that. You can drive with confidence. And, and I say, if, if you didn't, it'd be a mess of a journey, you know? Keep stopping. Do I turn here? Do I turn there? Have you ever heard of this place? Do you think I can get there? And, and you would, if you don't know who you are at your job at work, you don't take charge and do it, do you? You stand there paralyzed. You don't know what to do because you can't see yourself being that and doing it. You apologize for your existence. Now, imagine yourself. The Bible's full uh, of these pictures. Have you noticed that? The Bible's full of it. So it's obvious he wants you to use a part of you that can imagine pictures. So he says, surely they follow me. I got a picture of that, you see. I got a picture. When I get up in the morning, I can feel the loving kindness and goodness of God. I can imagine them pressing all around me. And actually, they, they've caught me and they've gone ahead of me uh, to do me good. And, and then it says, dwell in the house of the Lord. I can get that. That I, that I live, I dwell inside of God. But that's a picture. And when I describe the picture, it makes a picture in your head. Yeah. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? What pictures you get for that? That your body is the place where this God of loving kindness lives. I had to say that because this isn't dull talking about something. It is actually plunging in and seeing your present circumstance as God sees it. And most of that is too big for words, but we see it in pictures. And um, Psalm 23 does it so perfectly. Um, and then, of course, the very fact we're talking about it means that he said it. Isn't that fun? Not only did he see this in terms of him, he said it. He filled the air. Actually, the vibration of saying it vibrated all through his body and, and, and formed a, an energy field around him of truth. He said it. You know what it says in Scripture? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yeah, we say so. Uh, and, and if you're in an unfriendly household, find somewhere where no one can hear you and shout your jolly head off and, and say, this is me, this is my, this is the truth, this is the reality, this is who I am. And you will find that, as I said, the reverse of this is the whole world of worry and anxiety, fear. Um, you will find that will 
sort of gone. It can't stand in the light. It just collapses. And so, well, that's about it, isn't it? And so surely, surely, oh yes, surely, goodness and loving kindness will relentlessly, fiercely, recklessly pursue you all, all, all the days of your life. And he will put his arms gently around you. He will bear hug you with his tenderness and say, you are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. You're included. Amen. And now the blessing of this God who is love, His blessing of Father and Son and Holy Spirit rest upon you and in you and around you and ahead of you that wherever you go in these next days it shall be in the hilarious delight of who you are in Christ Jesus. So I bless you and declare this is the way it is.